You may me cry when you say goodbye. Be better shape. My children lay rain. Be better shape. You're the one to blame. You broke my heart. Ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Dylan Mora. So, <laughs> I'm very grateful to all of you for making this uh, uh, huge uh, uh, effort to, to, to meet me, and I will do everything I can to meet you halfway. Uh, and somebody has already given me uh, 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 some baking or something here. Um, I suspect this is probably a cake. Years ago, I made a joke, one joke about cake. And now, everywhere I go, people give me cake. More, more cakes? There's more cakes, yes. I do wish, sometimes, that I had made a joke about sex. But anyway, <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. So, I come to you from the West. <laughs> and you, a lot of you have been to the West. I know, because you served me coffee. <laughs> and, and there's a lot of Polish people in Dublin. And there's a lot of Polish people in London. There's a lot of Polish people all over Ireland and, and Britain. And we, you know this, a lot of you know this, the West is full of all these uh, images about the East, not just, not just Poland, all of Eastern Europe. And you know, it's, you have to come here to learn what it's really like, because we grew up with all these images and ideas about you, partly because of the Cold War, partly because of the Iron Curtain. When I was a kid growing up in Ireland, I watched a lot of cartoons, because you're very good at animation. And you sold them much cheaper than the Hollywood ones. <laughs> so Irish television bought them. <laughs> that probably explains some of the images. If you ask somebody in Britain or Ireland what do they think about Eastern Europe, you know, the, the, the images we have are terrible. <laughs> That's the truth. It's, they're terrible. It's, you know, you, people think of, you know, some woman in a, an apartment stirring a huge bowl of cats. <laughs> and a man playing a violin with no strings. <laughs> he has to make the noises himself, going... <laughs> singing terrible songs about all the different invasions that have happened over thousands of years. <laughs> and then a crab walks across the floor, and on top of the crab is a bowl full of children's feet. And you... <laughs> Terrible images. <laughs> Terrible stereotypes. <laughs> and of course, you have your own terrible stereotypes about the West. Big buildings and fat people and hamburgers. <laughs> and they're all true. And <laughs> but Poland, uh, uh, Anthony, my new Polish friend, told me earlier on, Poland doesn't have any fat people, or very few fat people. Well, hello, I'm fat. Um, but I'm European fat. You know, not American fat. That's a different thing. You know, American fat for people are so big, they would not know 
if they had a monkey hanging from the penis. <laughs> there could be a whole family of monkeys down there with roads and libraries and a whole infrastructure and a political system and the press the world know. That's American fact. And of course there are all sorts of links between Poland and Ireland because of Catholicism. Yes. Yes, ooh. And I'm very aware of when I tell you about Ireland, you have to remember I'm talking about the country I grew up in, Catholic Ireland. I'm not talking about you. I'm only talking about my experience. Now, recently, you had this um, uh, Archbishop. <laughs> Mickey, <laughs> who made this statement, and you're all aware of this, about how priests sometimes get dragged down <laughs> by children looking for love. <laughs> This is the kind of thing we heard in Ireland for a long time. When I was growing up, when I was a boy in Ireland, I found the whole Catholic system very confusing. I remember saying to my grandmother, who was much older, obviously. That was the way we had grandmothers in Ireland. They tended to be older people. From a different generation who didn't want to talk about a lot of things. But I didn't understand. I wanted to ask the questions. I remember saying to her, Granny, how many priests do you have to blow to get into heaven? <laughs> and, like I say, she didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> but I was persistent. And I said, come on, Granny, how many? And she said, about 50. Now, it's your turn. <laughs> so you can get answers if you ask the questions. <laughs> it's entirely natural for people to want to believe in something. We all want to believe in something. Okay? Now, where are you going to go? You're not going to go to politics. Not in this country. You're not going to go to poli po poli politica. Yeah. Yeah. And you know where you stand. Your pravo or your level. <laughs> and then, you know, if you're, if you're level, everybody hates you. Because you're the voice of conscience. You're the voice of responsibility. You're the one saying, we should all share. We should all share. I don't have anything. We should all share. <laughs> And, <laughs> if you're proud, though, you don't have a philosophy. Your attitude is just to say, what is this? Do we fuck it or eat it? <laughs> Let's try both. <laughs> there. Now, you might be one of the little... Let me see if I get this right. I'm going to fuck it up. I know I am. The, um, the Gileno people? Gileno? Gileno? Green. Yeah. What is it? Jelong. Jelong. You might go on the Jelong people. Everybody hates them. Because even though everything they say is true about the planet, you know, we have messed it up. We've made a mess. It's getting worse. There's no doubt about that. Everybody still hates them because they're so boring. These are people who come to you, invite them to your house for dinner, and you give them some food, and they say, I can't eat this. I'm vegan. <laughs> what, what, what's vegan? I just eat things that I find. <laughs> what, I understand vegetarian. Maybe you had an accident, you fell down some stairs, and now you can't chew properly anymore. <laughs> what is vegan? I can't deal with these people. Here's a torch, go into the garden, see what you can find. <laughs> because they lie. They say, you can get everything you need from lentils and pulses and leaves and shit like that. Everything you need except company. <laughs> which is not to be had. Because everybody you know will run away as you die in a cloud of your own green thoughts. <laughs> but you know where you stand. You know what your opinion is. It's hard to believe in anything. You can't believe in science. I mean, I believe in science. It's not going to give you any comfort, though. How many people believe in science here? Quite a lot of people. Quite a lot of people. People who turn to laugh at other people who have a religious faith. 
But like most of you, I don't understand any science. I just believe in it. So it's no different to having a faith as far as I can work out. Because sometimes people, scientists explain it to you, they go, oh, the stuff, the thing, the black hole, it comes out and that's why you get the negative energy goes into the I don't what it's far away, it's shining. Thank you. There's a guy on British television called Brian Cox. Is this show that program here? Yeah. Where he talks about the universe, and I don't understand it because he uses metaphors. Now, if you don't understand something, don't use a metaphor to explain it. Because he comes on and he says, Imagine your head is frozen gas and your feet are planets. <laughs> when you sit down, you're going to see a lot of moons in your armpits. What the fuck are you talking about? <laughs> And the truth is that for a lot of people who are secular, who don't believe in religion, they have a religion anyway because they've got technology. That's the new religion. Apple. And every six months, one of the high priests comes out and shows you the new pocket altar. It says, this thing, the ISO 5921, is so amazing. If I tried to explain how amazing it is, your mind would explode like a frog on a stove. <laughs> and they tell you what it can do. It can upspool a twin pixter for your mud humper. What are you talking about? <laughs> now with monkey trickle on dial back. Please, what is this? And this is what everybody uses, especially young people. There's a lot of young people out there. People who don't know how to be alone, because when you're alone, you mess around on a computer. I say to my kids, what are you doing? And they'll say, oh, I'm downloading a picture of a squid. <laughs> Why? I didn't have one before. <laughs> and when they're talking to you, they mess around on a phone. What is this? Oh, it's just an app. Well, what does it do? It measures the distance between me and sand. What is wrong with you? <laughs> this is a different one. I'm doing a different one now. What does that do? It tells me the burning point of celery. <laughs> People don't know how to be alone with themselves. Some of you may have come here tonight alone. You may live in an apartment by yourself, and you came out to escape that. <laughs> and the fact is, other people will judge you if you live alone. People will say, well, so what, you live with where you're married? No. Oh, so you got a girlfriend or a boyfriend? No, no. So what, some other people living in your apartment, some other flatmates, some crazy guys and girls? I bet you get up to all kinds of... No, it's just me. Whoa. And then, I'll see you later, okay? I'm just going to get some dips. I'll be back in a minute. Because we're freaked out by the idea of people who can take their own company. We're walking around an apartment, opening the doors, going, What's in here? What's in here? Oh, me! Ah! That's terrifying. <laughs> Now, this is the same the world over. You see, Poland has this long history, complicated history, many layers of um, influence. You've got different feelings about some of your neighbours. <laughs> I've travelled all over, and I, you know, I'm Britain because Britain and Ireland are islands. They, you know, they influence each other. But there's less influence from, from outside of outside of Europe, the other part of continental and, and east, western, and eastern Europe, the, the main landmass of Europe. So, but there's lots of stereotypes. You know, in Britain, for example, they're always saying that German people have no sense of humour. Now, this is actually not true. I went to Berlin, I did a show, people were great. But during the day, I was trying to find something to eat. And I don't eat pig. <laughs> I know that will disgust a lot of you, because you think everybody should, whenever they can. But, um, I don't eat pig, not for any religious reasons. I don't eat anything that's three letters long. <laughs> Dog, bog, car, tit, dad. I don't eat any of those things. And, I was, and as you know, Germany is, is, is the whole economy is based on pig. It powers the whole country. And people grind pork into their tea. And, <laughs> They walk around with sausages behind their ear in case they get caught out in a situation. And I don't understand German, but I understand a few syllables. So I walked into this cafe, it was empty, but it was open, and I understand a few syllables of German. And you know Germans love long words, they love compound words. They don't make a new word for a new idea or a piece of technology, they just add a bit of a word they already have onto another word that already exists. 
for I saw this on the menu, it said, Vegetarian schluff and hive of cows in the half schlaf schluff, schlaf of splits and gats and fruit and schluff and schlaf, and schlaf and fruit and schluff and schluff and mit and gats and fruit 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 and gats <laughs> so I said, please, can I get some of this? But listen, I said to the guy, you don't listen, you don't put any bacon or sausage in there, do you? Because I know you guys love all that stuff. And he said, no, it's very nice. I made it this morning. You should eat it. It's very tasty. <laughs> I said, no bacon. Or, no, it's really nice. It's delicious. You should have it. <laughs> really yummy vegetables. And so I got it, it was delicious, I was so happy, I was really hungry, and I was eating it, and then he was cleaning up, and he looked over, I was about halfway through the soup, he looked over, he said, you like it, Jack, the soup, it's nice, it's nice soup, you like it, it's tasty, yeah? I said, it's absolutely fantastic, thank you, fantastic, thank you so much. And he said, ha ha, I have jokes, it is made of pigs. <laughs> <laughs> Does this one actually be only used the faces? We just use the faces of tiny baby pigs. That's what you're eating. <laughs> so they have a sense of humor. It's just <laughs> But that, you know, Germans related to English, so we understand a little better of it. We understand some of the Romance languages. We're terrible if you speak English, you're terrible at languages generally, because everybody else is learning to speak English. It makes you very lazy. But, so, you know, I can understand a little French, a little Spanish, a little German, but, but the Slavic languages, your language, is very mysterious. <laughs> very mysterious. I was in Russia, again, a neighbor you may have mixed feelings about. And <laughs> I didn't understand anything. I thought I had a couple of words of Russian, because I was able to say, you know, Mojna Chai, and I got a cup of tea. And then people come up to you and they go, Balaj, I should be the boys in Balaj, I'm Balaj, I'm Balaj, I'm Balaj, I'm Balaj, I'm Balaj, And then they give you a shoe. So, you don't really get it anymore. I was in a shop in Prague. I saw a little piece of jewellery I was going to buy for my daughter. I asked the lady, how much is this? She said, moment, please. She went to the phone and she was going, it's bad, I should go. How much is this? Five minutes of this, okay? And she put the phone down and said, he doesn't know. <laughs> It's a different way of doing things, and I like it. It reminds me of Ireland. It does. My wife is Scottish. She would always say, you know, Irish people have this reputation for being charming. They do, believe it or not. I mean, you know, uh, enchanté all the time. And then, but that's charmed, but you know what I mean. And uh, she said to me, you know what all that is? It's because you lie all the time. <laughs> Somebody says to you, where's the chair I asked you to make me? People just go, ah, well, now, my brother, he has a fine singing voice, but he fell down a hole once. Have you met my sister? Here, have a sausage. <laughs> and they, they just don't answer your question. So uh, I'm, I'm learning, I'm learning, traveling around, trying to understand what's going on in Poland, in all the other countries around. And I noticed, speaking to young people, that everybody's learning English, which is great for me. <laughs> and, but there's a particular kind of English they're learning, and it's American English, a lot of the time. I mean, even my kids, my children, speak American English. Because I'll say to them, what are you going to do on Saturday? And they'll say, I'm going to be with my friends. <laughs> and they <laughs> 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 That's just wrong life. <laughs> and there's a lot of American values in American English. You hear parents on sports fields and parks shouting at their children, Go team! You know, all that positive stuff that comes out of America. Go team! We're number one! Eat shit, motherfucker! <laughs> and then, nobody can resist that positive message. <laughs> 
conservative is the religion in America. You know, giving it 100%, 200%, 5,000% 5, right now, right here. Oh, yeah, baby. I'm European. I give it 14%. Come on. <laughs> is on fire, maybe I'll go 16. That's about it. There's a kind of a threat in American positivity. People will say to you, you good? Yeah? You good? Yeah? Can you do any better? Put me up, you know, always smiling. You ready? Can we make some money here? Let's go. I was in a hotel, I was having a bowl of muesli. It's a German word. I don't know how to translate muesli. You know what muesli is. The shit you eat to keep yourself alive, okay? <laughs> Nobody wants it. You just do it because you're supposed to. I was eating and a guy walked past me and he said, How's your breakfast this morning, sir? Is it good? I said, It's great, thank you. It's a fucking muesli. Leave me alone. <laughs> I didn't say that, but that's what I wanted to say. Then a girl walked past. How's your muesli this morning, sir? It's really, thank you. It's so delicious. I can just thank you. That it's great. Eight people asked me because I wasn't being positive enough. What they wanted me to do was to take the bowl, put it on my head, and sing a song on the table. Go, this is the shed. I can see you again. Thank you for the grapes and the berries. But I can't do that. I prefer Polish music. This is Polish music. <laughs> People give me this stuff. I can't eat it anymore. I'm too old. Mm. You can eat this if you're a child. Because your body just turns it into, into extra kilometers to run. You get to my age, you eat this, it becomes extra people to carry your coffee. <laughs> Where I live... Oh, I've got chocolate on the floor. I'm really sorry. It's like Bucharest, where I just came from. There's stuff everywhere. <laughs> yeah. It's one of those places you want gloves to pick up everything. The, um... Whoa, what the fuck? Who's been here before me? What were they doing? That's, that could be racist if it was interpreted wrongly, so don't. And the... <laughs> Stilts walking around that place. It was just, ah, what is this here? With the dogs and everything was second hand. Everything. Apples. They could have a light out of them on the tree. And they... <laughs> what were we saying? Listen, don't get sensitive, okay? I don't want to insult you, your country, your history, your faith, your beliefs, your political hope for the future, the relationships between men and women, anything. No, I don't want to know. What I'm saying is I don't want to, but if that's what happens, listen, that's what happens. I'm not... <laughs> People have their own sensitivities, and you don't always know what they're going to be. I can, I'm, just, I'm just pleased to meet you. Pleased to be able to talk. We need to have a conversation, and I, I'm glad it's one of those ones where I get to do all the talking first. Because that means we can work things out later. You can disagree with me. Uh, now, look. I, 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 I'm going to start now. <laughs> we should start now. We've said a lot, okay? This is real, this is happening. <laughs> Europe is in a crisis. It's in an economic crisis. Now, there are worse things happening in the world. There are wars. People are dying. Fighting for freedom. Their governments are killing them. So it's a sign of civilization that all we have is a, is a financial crisis. And a lot of young people out there who come out of university, come out of work, they're looking for jobs. Like I said, lots of you do emigrate. There's a big tradition of that in Poland, just like there was in Ireland. But if you look at where the economic crisis is, you'll see it's in all the fun countries. Ireland, Portugal, Greece, Spain, all those places. Pe places where people go to relax and open some buttons on their shirt and drink too much at lunchtime and walk around saying, oh look, there's some old stuff. <laughs> There's no economic crisis in Germany. I'm just saying. <laughs> because nobody ever said, I want to go to Germany to relax. And then... <laughs> no, no. Please, that's not set nation against nation. That's the second half. I'm just dealing with broader... Let's just work on the hemispheres for now. The... <clears throat> I try to explain to my kids, because they're worried. They have to work very hard in school to try and get a job. 
they come up to me with their mathematics homework, they'll say, I don't understand this, Dad. If x equals y minus c, how can it be a negative value if c is an integer? And I'm just totally honest with them. I say, look, here's one euro, okay? Or 18 zlotties, or whatever it is. <laughs> what? Sensitive, I told you, watch that. I need to walk on that. That's a sign of a mature civilization. You can take it. <laughs> one euro, 300,000 zlotties, whatever it is. <laughs> You know how much chocolate you can buy with one zloty, okay? Now here is five euros, an unimaginable amount of zlotties. <laughs> Imagine how much chocolate you can get with that. I didn't understand those mathematics the first time when I was in school. I'm not looking at them again. Take the money, walk away. Thanks so much. <laughs> because you've got to be straight with them. They need to understand how it works. My kids will come to me and say, Dad, I want an ice cream. And I'll say, look, you have to clean your room. That's how it works. Work and reward. Clean your room. And they go, yeah, but I just want a small one. No, clean your room first. Yeah, but look, just a little tiny one, just one scoop of ice cream. No, I'm getting a headache. We've spoken about this before. Would you like an ice cream? I would actually quite like an ice cream right now. Give me the money, I'll get it for you. There you go, thank you, I'll clean your room. You have to explain how it works. <laughs> A lot of you will be in your 20s and worried about the future. How am I going to get a job? How am I going to be able to afford to buy an apartment? Don't worry about all that stuff. There's no jobs. My generation took care of that. We spent all the money. There's no jobs or fun left. And you will never be able to buy an apartment. But you can relax, because we're going to put you all in jail. We have plans for you. We're going to put you in jail, and then every half an hour, one of us will come down and kick you in the head and say, What's Instagram? Because we don't understand that shit. <laughs> now, And you have to remember, if you're 25 years old, you've got everything anyway. You know, you're young, you're beautiful, you're stupid. What more do you want? <laughs> That's as good as it gets. You wake up in the morning, you can do whatever you want. You look at your breakfast and you go, I'll just eat this and then walk around and talk shit all day long and find someone to go to bed with. And you do, even though it's just Wednesday. <laughs> it gets much more complicated when you get older. You get over 40, you wake up, you've got voices in your head. You look at your breakfast and you think, oh, I'll just eat this. Voice number one begins. Eat this, you, you fat fuck. You had breakfast yesterday. Look at you now. You're going to do this all over again? You disgust me, you fucking thing. You're in the middle thinking, leave me alone, I just want to eat my breakfast. The other voice starts up. More jam. You deserve more jam than your children. Take their jam. Put it in your pockets. Run away. Eat it in the toilets. They won't find you in there. What have they ever done for you? <laughs> This is before you leave the house, after a night of terrible dreams, if you can sleep. 25 years old, you dream whatever you want. You dream you are Poland itself, redefining its borders, in a box, spraying different cheeses at the side. You get older, you dream you're stuck in aisle three of the supermarket going, where's the yogurt, where's the yogurt, where's the yogurt? Because that's all that happened to you that day. Your life dwindles to nothing. That's if you can sleep. And who sleeps, to be honest? Who sleeps, really? You can't sleep. Not if you're a true... If you're a person. If you're 25, you're not a person. You sleep like a 25-year-old. Because you know nothing. Uh, you're so exhausted from sex, you sleep. But... <laughs> If you're a real human being, if you're a mature human being in the 21st century, you can't sleep. Because you lie in bed thinking, what if this thing happens? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if they happen together? <laughs> what if I died? How would my wife and children cope? How would they deal with that? They wouldn't. They'd be out in the street stealing food from pigeons' mouths. <laughs> if you live alone, you just think, what if I died? <laughs> <laughs> you're with somebody else, you've got to find me. How would they cope? They wouldn't cope, it would be terrible. Or worse, they would be fine. <laughs> they'd have a nicer, cleaner house, there'd be less arguing, everything would work better. Inevitably, your partner would find somebody else to go to bed with within two or three days of you being dead. <laughs> they would have a lot of sex in your bed when you were dead. The morning, the afternoon, the evening, and the night time would be the main times they'd be having sex in your bed when you were dead. <laughs> Doing all those things you dreamed about but were too afraid to ask. <laughs> Running at each other, holding chickens. <laughs> Jumping off the wardrobe with cucumbers in their mouth, singing songs of patriotism. <laughs> Hiding under the bed to catch each other's ankles and drag each other down and stick gimp masks over each other and play Mexican 
music. <laughs> All of the things you wanted to do. And now you're dead, and they are fucking each other's brains out. <laughs> and then you realize you're lying beside somebody who's waiting for you to die. <laughs> and what's more, they're sleeping to make the time go fast. <laughs> you are the last piece of person. <laughs> Nobody can help you. Nobody cares. Does everybody, are we okay so far? Does everybody understand everything? Am I talking? Am I seriously? And this is, this is for me to learn. Am I speaking too quickly? No. Okay. And okay. <laughs> All right. You've got to be careful, you know. I'll tell you a secret. A real secret? No. I'm in Warsaw. And so are you, and you live here, and you understand me quicker and faster than the people in Kansas, in America. <laughs> and you are slimmer. But anyway, <laughs> if we want belief, if we want to believe in something. Now the English word belief means belief, okay? <laughs> you see? It means to be held dear, to be loved. That's all. To be loved. To hold something dear, to love it, to be held dear. So when people insult races, nations, religions, the reason people get upset is because what you're really saying to them is, you're not worthy of love. You're unlovable. Now, Poland is famously religious, Ireland is famously religious. Some religions are easier to insult than others. <laughs> this is true. With some religions, all you've got to do is go up to people and say, your God smells of crisps. And, <laughs> or your God dances like this. <laughs> and people get upset and burn your house down. <laughs> Because we all want to be precious. And love itself, which I used to know the Polish word for about half an hour ago. I forgot. Wait, yes, that's it. Thanks. The, um, love itself is a kind of a religion. It's kind of a cult. Somebody will say to you, do you love me? Do you love me? I love you. How much do you love me? Thank you very much. Will you love me next week? What about next month? Especially next year, I'm planning to be a real prick around there. Do you think about me all the time? Do you? Do you suddenly realize you're not thinking about me and feel terrible? Will you make me laugh? Will you feed me? Will you tickle me? Will you do all those things? It is a cult that you're being invited into. And you're told there's one person out there for you. One. Soulmate. It's you, baby. <laughs> Let's work on that later. We can see how that goes. Usually I don't get heavily involved with furred things. <laughs> one person, out of the billions, out of the sea of humanity, there's one soulmate out there for you. Nobody knows where they are. You have to find them. Try the local disco. <laughs> now this is a lie. There are millions of people out there perfect for you. They love all the things you like. Cheese, freedom from religious persecution, sitting down. They love all that shit. <laughs> but you're told there's one. And the traditional way to find them is to drink ten of something. <laughs> and then go to a building you can hardly see, and music that drowns out all speech. And go up to a total stranger and go, ah! <laughs> you go home with this person, you might spend a night, a week, a month. You might get married, you might have children. And you met this person when you were totally shit-faced, and so were they. <laughs> but you wouldn't buy a toaster when you're drunk, because it's too important. <laughs> that toast has to be crispy in just the right way. <clears throat> now this is the same for gay and straight relationships. Exact same. I grew up, as I said, in Ireland in the 70s. Very conservative. So I can't help but think conservatively about some things. When I see the young gay guy arguing with the bishop about gay rights and gay marriage, I can't help it, I think conservative. 
I always tend to agree with the person who isn't dressed as a wizard. <laughs> because I just feel they'll be more attached to a larger reality somehow. <laughs> However, inspired all the sexual choices made by the 385-year-old man wearing gold and purple and chartreuse holding the big dodging of our jewellery have been over the years. <laughs> you see, we're all judged by something. You're judged by God or you're judged by yourself. Or by somebody else. Maybe you're lucky enough to be in a relationship where you're judged by somebody else. Like if you go out tonight and you have a good time and you have too many drinks, you do it to escape yourself, to get away from yourself, really. Because look, reality is hard. There's a lot of it around. I don't even watch the news anymore, to be totally truthful with you. I just have two men sitting in chairs, facing each other at the end of my room. Every hour, on the hour, one of them shouts into the other one's face, Terrorist! And the other one shouts, Pedophile! And then a woman walks in between them and says, Rain expected. That's all you need! <laughs> so there's a, lot to what, there's a lot we want to get away from. How do you do this? How do you escape? Some people do it through love. Some people do it through computer games. Some people do it through sitting in their room alone watching Game of Thrones and stuff like I can't watch things like that, those series that go on forever, because I look at the guy and I think you put on a helmet and a cape and a pelt and daggers and amulets and swords and thongs and straps and sandals, all just to walk up a hill and go, the boats are coming, get a job. <laughs> I can't watch that stuff. There was a real fashion for these detective series. Uh, in, in, in Europe. You know, a lot of them were set in Scandinavia. Do you know these programs? I don't know. I haven't checked this out with anybody. Like Borgen and the Killing and these things. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so these were huge, hugely fashionable, kind of hipster things, really. Um, where, you know, there would be detectives and they were speaking in a language that nobody understood and there would be a lot of snow and then people would go, hmm, I've got diabetes. And, <laughs> and then, and the more obscure they were, the better. The last one was called Misplaga Naska Nak Nak Ya Gada Nyuk. It's Finnish. It translates as hot. And it's about these three amateur detective fishermen who get trapped in a cabin over the winter. And one of them is in love with the other one, but his ears freeze because it's so cold. And the other one gets shorter because that's how cold it is. And the other one is narcoleptic and insomniac. He spends his whole time doing this. It lasts for three months. And these are fashions that come and go. And there's a tremendous pressure on you to stay involved in what's happening, what's now, what's current, what's hip. You know, just because you're not really allowed to get old anymore. That's the truth. You know, this is why advertising is always about sex. Sexy garages, sexy dentures, sexy walking frames. <laughs> what, are you, what are you, 85 years old? That's nothing. Put your sexy diaper on and give me some press-ups right now. Let's go, baby. <laughs> we live in a tyranny of youth. Of course I want to be 25, again, in the morning, and I wake up. I was in an art gallery over the summer, and it was very hot. I was wearing um, and shorts, not shorts, old man shorts, you know, trousers that go to about there. And I had on these odd socks, you know, and they weren't like cool, jazzy, pink and blue or anything. It was just a crappy brown sock and a crappy uh, black sock. And there was this young guy, I think he was a hipster. I'm not even sure I understand what hipsters are. But he had tortoiseshell glasses and sort of sculptural hair and he was very carefully dressed. He had a beautiful girlfriend as well. You know, one of these beautiful, slim women with fiery hair and she was wearing a dress. She didn't even look like she'd put it on. She looked like she'd fallen out of an airplane and it was just on a washing line and she collided. <laughs> and they were sort of nudging each other and pointing at me, and pointing at my socks and laughing at me. And I couldn't work out if it was because I was an old sad guy or because I was an old sad guy trying to look cool. And I thought I would forget about it and I walked away, but I didn't. And I really wanted to find that young guy again and pick him up by his face and say, listen, you're young now. You're walking around the gallery with your beautiful girlfriend, and she's listening to everything you're saying as you talk about how the paintings make you feel, even though you use words like jodhpurs and paradigm. <laughs> that is a joke for English speakers. I'm sorry about that. I shouldn't be worried about that. And, and she listens to you on a Sunday morning when you're talking about how excited you are about all your startups and upcoming projects. And she's brushing crumbs of toast from her honey-colored breasts, listening to you. But there will come a time when she doesn't. 
But she walks up to you and she says, here, hold the kid, and walks away and doesn't tell you where she's going. <laughs> there will come a time when you wake up in the morning and you don't get dressed so carefully because you're not even sure if you're alive. You just stick your hand in the drawer and pull out anything that's not a bra or an action figure and you put it on your <laughs> Things change. And you don't stay beautiful forever. It all goes away. So you have to learn to value different things. Everything gets taken away. I used to be a young man with a body. <laughs> Not anymore. My son doesn't respect me. He's 11 years old. I say to him, hey, what's happening? What's going on? He doesn't even speak to me. He walks up to me. He puts his hand in my stomach and goes, bleep, 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 bleep. And walks away. <laughs> he doesn't understand. I can't control this. It has nothing to do with me. I'm too busy to move any of my limbs. I can't exercise. I mean, I eat what I want when I want because I'm a grown-up and I can. I'm not like him, I don't have to eat vegetables if I don't want to. <laughs> the truth is that most of the great times in your life were about putting things in your mouth. <laughs> this begins from birth. The baby is born, it seeks out the breast. It stays there. It doesn't take any meetings or calls or anything. <laughs> it stays there with mama. As it's full of milk, falls asleep, wakes up, does it all over again. Then the child grows up and begins to explore all of nature, everything that nature can offer, all the chicken nuggets and burgers and the other vegetables that nature has. <laughs> and then people get addicted to smoking and drinking, and everybody says, oh, that's disgusting. But that's what it is to be a human being. You, you look for something to be addicted to. That's how you decide if you like it. You pick it up, you lick it, you sniff it, you bite it. If it doesn't make you a slave, you throw it away and find something else that does. <laughs> And then, and then just when you find out what it is you do like, you have to give everything up. You get to a certain age, you can't eat any salt, fat, carbohydrate, all the things that make food worthwhile. Because you're supposed to give everything up so you can live longer. You want to live longer, don't you? Of course you do. What kind of a sick fuck would you be if you didn't want to live longer so you can go to Tesco's again and get on the bus? Isn't that great stuff? Of course you want to live longer. And of course you've got to give up alcohol so you can be sober and fully aware of the fact that you're living longer and you desperately want to die. <laughs> <laughs> and in order to do this, people will try all kinds of crazy stuff. The diets, the one where you don't eat for two days a week, the other one where you just eat strawberries as you run upstairs. There's another one as you paint barbecue sauce on your own margina and <laughs> Eat opposite a pit bull who's on a leash that's fraying because it speeds up your metabolism. <laughs> None of these things work and then you die. We're all going to die. That's one of the very few true things you can say at any time. We are all going to die. But people hate it when you say it out loud, especially during sex. <laughs> they hate it. <laughs> people hate the truth. If you shout that out as you orgasm, people get very upset. <laughs> what is the time? I don't remember when I came on. Oh, let's have a break. Shall we have a break? Yes. Yes, let's. All right, go and have something. Go and refresh yourselves and cool down, and I'll see you in a little minute. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> And the, um, huge horse, but the, um, <laughs> and, um, and exactly, because of earlier on, when we were saying, and the thing, because of the, you see, so it all makes sense in the end, good. So, um, it's really terrific to be here in the best, the, uh, <laughs> now look. Be serious for a moment, because you know we're at a critical time in human history. 
especially here, and we should all be very, let's have a minute silence for everything. <laughs> it's never happened ever. <laughs> I'm very lucky to be here, I'm aware of that. And so are you, but you're not so aware. The, um, <laughs> no, I am, because I work in the arts, effectively. That's what's called the arts. I mean, the truth is, you know, I've never had a real job, which is terrible in lots of ways. And I should be punished, but that won't happen. <laughs> All the people I know are writers, actors, directors, musicians, painters. Wankers is the word we have in English. <laughs> people who... People who walk into places like this and say, Oh, I love this space! <laughs> Is there any way we can make it bigger and smaller at the same time? <laughs> Somebody get me a cappuccino, please. No coffee or milk. <laughs> <laughs> so in lots of ways, I feel like I'm not a real man. Yes. And I know that those gender identities are very uh, important in the East and in Poland. You know, men are men, women are women. That's it. <laughs> Let's not get confused. <laughs> and when you see the image of what a man is in movies and so on, like if you see people from the East in Hollywood movies, generally, if there's a guy, he'll be, if there's a facet, he'll be, oh yeah. If he'll be, Mispronounced, but oh yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> he would be. He'd be some shady character. He'll have a scar starting here, going right here, and all across the furniture in his apartment. And he won't have a left hand. It'll just be a blender or a whisk or a hook or something. And he says things like, "Since I come to your country, it's very easy for me to make bomb." <laughs> Because you stupid Americans spent all day outside playing baseball. I mean, can make bombs from cereal and cat. And, and if there's a woman, a copietta? All right. Now we're cooking. If there's a copietta, she's very mysterious. She says things like, I don't want to talk about it. It doesn't matter anymore. Nothing does. And she's very beautiful and she walks away. <laughs> and these images that were sold of male and female, you know, I mean, like, I, I, I was on holiday uh, recently with my family and uh, we got a, you know, we were with the children all day. Uh, we were in Croatia and we were, we were, you know, it's very beautiful, blue and castles and the sea and it was beautiful and tedious. And then, uh, <laughs> you know, after a few hours, you go, yeah, please. Please, somebody show me a dead goat. I've had enough of this. And then, <laughs> so we've been talking to the children all day, you know, talking, you know, children like the children full of children's questions. Does Batman have a bat toilet? I don't know. And, <laughs> So about 8 o'clock we were very tired, so we got a film, we bought a film from the supermarket so we wouldn't have to talk to the children anymore. And we got, I mean, it was kind of an action film, it was a Liam Neeson movie, it was called The Grey in English. And uh, it was about these bunch of guys in an aeroplane flying over some landscape covered in snow, tall trees, lots of wolves. And the plane crashes. And then he has to look after everybody and save everybody who's left alive. And he's, you know, it's all action. He's crawling mountains with his face and jumping into frozen rivers and killing wolves with a pencil and then making a delicious three-course meal for six from, from the innards of the wolf and all this stuff. And I was looking at this thing. Is that what a man is supposed to be? And by the way, a few years ago, this is true, I was walking down the streets of Greenwich Village in New York and there were these two women talking outside a cafe and one of them saw me and she stopped talking and she was sort of looking at me. I was like, what's wrong with you? I walked past. She came after me and she said, excuse me, are you Liam Neeson? <laughs> That's true. And, <laughs> and like you, I laughed. I laughed. And then I said yes. And, <laughs> but an hour later we were in a hotel room fucking each other's brains out. And, Great. I think she worked in the financial district. There was a lot of numbers and flow charts and predictions about the yen coming out of her as we were at it. And, and then I got a bit spooked. 
because I realized I recognized this woman. It was freaky. I thought, I know you. And I thought, I'm imagining this. I'm dreaming. No, I do. I recognize you. And I did. It was Sean Penn. And, <laughs> and then, it actually worked out wonderfully well. We spent Christmas together. We went over to see Hugo Chavez. We put in an irrigation system for the mountain people because he was trying to win the rural vote. It was a bad <laughs> experience. But anyway, this film... <laughs> The Grey. He's doing all this, he's climbing the mountains of this face, he's jumping into the river. I was like, is that what a man is supposed to be? Because I couldn't do any of that. Not, not, not for five seconds. If it's a frozen river, jump in a frozen river, are you out of your fucking mind? <laughs> it's cold and wet. I'm not doing that. Where is the wolf? Eat me. Eat my head. Start with my head. Eat it. Eat it now. <laughs> The only thing I could do in that situation would be to make a telephone out of snow and go, get me the fuck out of here, I hate this shit. <laughs> but like a lot of men, I'm a middle-aged, soft, comfortable guy with a family. You know, so I'm not, I'm not a man in lots of ways. Not in the way it's presented to us. So what happens is you get addicted to violent films. Because, like, you know, Matt Damon films or Jason Statham films, you outsource your masculinity. <laughs> you end up watching these films, because you know a Jason Statham picture, right? He's got one wire going between his brain and his arsehole, another one going between his dick and his heart. If he pulls the wrong wire, he swallows his eyes and vomits his head. <laughs> <laughs> An ubermensch, he always makes the right decision. He pulls the whole lot out. You see, that's how decisive he is. That's what the fantasy is. It's about being decisive. These men in films are always decisive. And most men are not decisive. Look at a man in the supermarket. <laughs> Put him in front of the shampoo. <laughs> And the implication is that they're so ultra-heterosexual as well. There's no way Jason Statham could ever make love with another man. No way. Unless that other man contained information <laughs> that could only be retrieved through the enzymes in sperm. That's the only way that's good. <laughs> it's an impossible kind of male ideal. It's fascistic. And so it's equally fascistic for women. Because the pressure is on you, if you're a woman, to be beautiful at all times. First thing in the morning. You've got to be gorgeous. All day long. And that's why women do all the crazy shit to themselves. They make their hair bulletproof. They get the implants that... And the shoes. You see women all over the ancient capitals of Europe walking around cobble over cobblestones in these shoes. These ones. And then women lie about it, because they've had all the murty bing about it. They lie about it, and they say, oh, I did it for me. I enjoy taking three days to get out of a chair. I've always wanted to look like a shrimp who's being airlifted. <laughs> this is a lie. This is not the kind of thing you do for yourself. You know what I did for me? I had an eclair inside an eclair. That's the kind of thing you do for yourself. You don't go and get bejazzled and get a little chandelier hung over your uterus. That's for other people. A lot of pressure. And of course it's harder to be a woman biologically. Just in terms of drama. Change. If you're born a woman, you're an infant, you're a tiny baby, you grow up, you're a little girl, you become a girl, then you're a girl woman, then you're a woman girl. <laughs> You've got hips and breasts, you menstruate, you get older, you're having sex, then you might have a child. You're looking after this child, it's a very complex biological relationship, mentally, psychological, every single sphere you can imagine is complex. You just carry on maturing, <laughs> woman looking after a family. And you get older, you get to this point in your life where there's another big change, everything goes quiet. <laughs> and then you get old. And then if you're a man, it's a lot easier. You're born, you're a child, you have one finger up your nose, your other hand on your dick, and you get taller. That's all the matter. <laughs> and Mother Nature is very cruel. 
is Mother Nature looks at that woman who's been through so much. I mean, her whole life long, it's been like an opera where the masks keep falling to the floor going, who am I? What child? I don't know. I'm fucking nuts. And then <laughs> she gets to this late point in her life and Mother Nature looks at her and thinks, what can I do for this woman? It's been very hard for her. What can I do? She's been this, she's been that. What can I do now that winter is stealing into the garden? How can I give her some energy, some get up and go, some vim? What can I do for this woman? I don't know. I've done everything. There's nothing left in my box of tricks. I don't know anything. Oh, I know. A beard. There you go. <laughs> Get down the house, baby. <laughs> Throw it! There's nothing left for you then. You can join the terrible folk band. There's nothing else. <laughs> Life is very difficult if you're a person. It's the worst position to be in. Now, if you're alone, if you came here alone, people would ju judge you, as I said. People in couples would judge you. I think you're sad and scary. <laughs> because you don't have the big form of entertainment they enjoy every day. If you're in a couple, the main form of entertainment is trying to prove to the other person, and a couple is a strange organism. It's a creature that's half as intelligent as the most intelligent member. <laughs> and you both know who that is. <laughs> you spend your whole time constantly trying to prove to the other person in the relationship that they are clinically, medically, irrefutably insane. <laughs> you see couples? Look at the way your parents talk when you go and visit them. They look at your father and mother's walk across the room, the other one's going... <laughs> 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 and you actually start this much earlier than you think, following each other around going, <laughs> What are you doing now? What are you doing? What are you trying to do? Have you ever watched yourself eating soup? Have you? Your arm does this. What is that about? Was it something that happened to you as a child? <laughs> You're trying to sleep beside an open window. Are you out of your fucking mind? Just tell me, are you a sociopath or a psychopath? Because I want to get you the right thing for Christmas. <laughs> and it is the people who know you, who love you, who will get you. Strangers might be rude. Associates might get in your way. But the people who love you will fuck you up. Because they know how you work. They wait. They wait for the quiet moment. When you're lying on the pillow together, they will whisper up to you, your nose hair, which is grey, is in my eye. They will get you. Punish you for loving you. You see, women remember. We have history because we have women. <laughs> women remember everything. Short, medium, long, they've got it all. A woman remembers something you said 17 years ago! <laughs> And the way you looked at her just now. <laughs> Men remember nothing. A man does not know when his life became so difficult, when everybody else became so stupid. He does not know how he came to be outside his own house at two in the morning holding a sausage. <laughs> and scientists say this is because the brain is mysterious. This is nonsense. The brain has three parts. The front, the middle, and the back. The front bit is the one that comes up with the excuse. I was out. I was with Mark. You know, Mark, he's all totally in talking and talking. The middle bit is the one that remembers to buy the sausage, and the back one is the one that plays the last song that was on in the pub before you left. <laughs> Let's go surfing now. Everybody's learning how to <laughs> jump. I grew up in a time when these roles were very defined, when men were men and women were women. I'm talking about a time when a man would receive a phone call in a pub on a landline. He would be in the middle of an argument. 
with some other man talking about something they didn't understand. <laughs> the Middle East. Yeah, I would have to handle it very differently. <laughs> this is in the days when men didn't shave off their hair if they were going bald. They just did this. <laughs> or they grew very thin, high, white hair. Purely theoretical hair you could look through to the wallpaper behind them. <laughs> men died in pubs, sometimes huge, holding a huge lump of ham they had under their arm. Part of a pig. They would just have a heart attack and fall over. <laughs> this is in the time when, when women were women. When women had women's things. That's what they were called. Nobody knew what they were. <laughs> you would go to some social occasion, a woman wasn't there, and you would say, Oh, where's Asha? And be told, Oh, Asha, she's not here. She's at home. She has women's things. <laughs> Nobody knew what they were. She could have been at home stuffing jam into envelopes. Or... <laughs> polishing an onion with her feet. It was none of your fucking business. You respected that. This is when every woman had a vanity table in the bedroom. You know the little desk with the mirror? So every woman could have somewhere, somewhere in her own home, to sit and weep. <laughs> about all the terrible things done to her by men. To help this memory, she would open the hat box full of precious things. The tram ticket from 25 years ago. The chocolate wrapper from 30 years ago. A bundle of letters 385 years old. So precious they must never be looked at or thrown away. Because <laughs> women remember. They remember, and this is what equips womankind, to ask questions that cannot be answered by men. Not by mortal men. When my wife says to me, Why? Why did you leave the wet towels on the bathroom floor? There is no answer. Unless I come up with something like, Well, me and the guys in the basement were planning for weeks how to fuck you up. And we thought that was the way to go. There's nothing I can say. And there are statements she can make that are not available to me because I'm a man. The questions I ask her are the opposite. They're direct, they're self-contained, they're self-explanatory. Have you ever eaten pheasant? This is what she said to me. Not really. What does that mean? Did somebody drop it in your drink? Was it a speeding car? You just had one lick. What happened? <laughs> this is the linguistic divide. I don't want to make too much of it, because of course we are mostly the same. But you have to enjoy the difference. We have to enjoy the difference between genders, races, religions, countries. Because if we don't, we'll punish each other for it. I sometimes wish I was a woman. <laughs> I do. It's so much, you know, the whole tradition of seduction and flirting is so much easier for women. It's all laid down. There are certain things you do. You look at someone, then you look away like you weren't looking at them. You look back and look down. And then reveal a little bit more of yourself. And then look back a bit and walk away and ha ha ha. <laughs> and the other person just, the other person's left there going, oh, yeah! <laughs> For men, what are you supposed to do? It doesn't work. You can't use that system. <laughs> Give them a little look at your pierogi and then, you know. <laughs> This is the whole visual tradition of eroticism for women. It's all about this. It's women touching themselves and going, yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah, I'm dangerous. I, you never know. You never know what's going to happen around me. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't work. Maybe it's because it's the male body. I mean, you know, 
when men, when women were being designed, it was up to some sort of great occasion in some Italian design house. <laughs> Everybody was enjoying themselves, going, Molto, molto, curves, big hair, funny stuff, a drink holder, get them out of here. And then when men were being produced, it was some sort of triple shift in dance or somewhere. And <laughs> before 89, when it, they'd run out of... <laughs> They would run out of material, they were just going block, stick, block, stick, thing, there. Oh, there's no material left for the genitalia, never mind, give us some of the elbow skin left over from the women. Here we go, bam, 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 that's fine. Which is why male genitalia is so depressing. It looks like something hanging out the side of a shark's mouth. Or some piece of fast food you drop on a carpet of hair. You sometimes hear the French have a phrase for le petit more, the melancholia that sends on people after making love, because it's so difficult to connect with another human being. Really, we are all imprisoned within ourselves. We are the prisoner, the jail, and the jailer. All we can do is peek into one another's yards. This is difficult to translate, I'm sorry. <laughs> You're trapped within yourself. You make these gestures to reach out to somebody else, but essentially you are alone. Have you ever had a bath? <laughs> it feels like that. It goes on for a bit too long. And the... <laughs> so this is the melancholia that describes the after-bath of the attempt to reach out to another person. But it's nothing compared to the intense suicidal feelings you have after an evening of self-pleasure if you are male. <laughs> Partly this is because of the material you have to work with. It's just so depressing. If there was something attractive down there, like a kitten's head, and you could just take on the chin until it got sick, <laughs> it would be fine. <laughs> now, I'm very aware that I'm speaking in a country that has great literature. <laughs> I hope I haven't broken the machine. I'm not very good at these things. Oh, oh no. Good, that's, I think that's fixed it. The, um, I don't understand all that stuff. If something breaks in my house, like the boiler or the cooker or whatever it is, my wife sometimes says, oh, the thing, it doesn't seem to be working. I just say, get a man. Where are you? I'm upstairs in our bedroom rubbing your expensive creams on my knees. I want to see what happens. I'm listening to musicals and I'm reading your magazines. The door is locked. Leave me alone. Thank you. <laughs> but, what time is it? I have to keep an eye on the... No. That's no. no. Wait, I'm just checking. <laughs> you know when you're at work, sometimes you go, oh, fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> Now, we mentioned lots of things, and I was right. And then, <laughs> with love and connect, wanting to connect to another person, you know, people, like, like I said earlier on, this is what you're drawn towards, but also you try to get away from, you try to escape from. This is why pornography is such a huge industry, because for a lot of men, sex is just too important to involve another person. <laughs> You know, traditionally, men are aroused visually by, you know, images of well, people having sex. They're not terribly imaginative when it comes. They're not very, there's not a lot of illusion or anything going on. It's just, ah, yeah, people having sex. Hey. And they, but women have always been aroused more by language. Or so I believed when I started this, this job. And then, <laughs> they, And there was this huge sensation about a year and a half ago, this book, uh, Fifty Shades of Grey, oh. which people often make that noise in rooms because it's so disgusting, the idea that anybody would have read it, I'm sure nobody here has, all of those millions of copies that were sold were obviously bought by squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> I went to the bookshop, I read a page of this book, it was very funny. And I thought, this has got to be easier. This has got to be an easier way of making a living. 
I am tired traveling the world, talking to people, trying to save them. <laughs> this has got to be an easier way to make a living. So I started. Now, it doesn't have a title. It's just called Erotic Fiction Blockbuster. <laughs> it goes like this. Oh, hang on, that's upside down. <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes, she said. I started with no, but then I got blocked. <laughs> <laughs> Are you? He said. <laughs> Why are you in my bathroom? She stared at the Tesco's bag twisting against his knee. Her breast heaved. And then her other breast heaved as well. She stared at his midriff. That's this bit. Naked under his vest, shirt, cardigan, and three quarter length stuff and coat. <laughs> he stepped closer. Cruelly, deliciously, his duffel buttons pressed into her soft flesh. She thought she might explode right there and come over the loofah and everything. <laughs> What's in the bag? she said. What's in my bag? he said. <laughs> referring to her question of just a minute ago. <laughs> <laughs> if you are getting aroused, don't be embarrassed. Remember, it's happening to everybody else. <laughs> yes, she said, showing no fear apart from some brief, intense fiddling with her hospital bracelet. <laughs> His gaze was stern, unyielding, like an Easter Island head stuck in traffic. <laughs> He said. <laughs> but because he had a class palate problem, it came out as cloop. <laughs> <laughs> then they had sex loads of times. <laughs> 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 I'm writing another book as well. It's just very simple because I want to bring nations together, to peoples together. It's an international recipe book. Going for Catholic soup, shame soup, <laughs> pour any liquid into any bowl, think about all the bad things you ever did, enjoy. And <laughs> it's a Protestant almost nice cake. You use a stale piece of sponge in a regional hotel beside a relative with Alzheimer's. In a hotel lobby reeking of sexual despair and dead ass pedestrians. <laughs> Scientology meatballs. <laughs> Stare at a meatball for 15 hours, then demand it gives you 100 grand. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're talking a lot about, I don't know, in plans with this, but this is the way it happens. We're talking a lot about gender. One of the things that annoys me. About, uh, oh, uh, is there a strong woman in the house? The uh, <laughs> gender stereotype is this idea that women are hugely, uncontrollably emotional and men are not. What's the phrase people use in Poland? Is it, you know, for premenstrual tension, pre PMS? What is it called? Yeah. PMS? PMS. What? I'm interested in the Polish word because... You don't have it! <laughs> <laughs> I've heard that before. <laughs> and somebody's telling me why I'm just wrong. But the end... Um... <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Is there a word? That is the word. <laughs> and it's absolutely necessary that it has 89 syllables. Isn't it? <laughs> what does the translation? PMS. 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 Oh, 
okay. There's no reason to get upset. <laughs> <laughs> Over now the myth is that it's only women who experience this. And men love this. The whole idea. Oh, you're so irrational, you're so crazy, you know. You're a woman, you're just so unpredictable and wild. I have to cope with you like you're some sort of crazy child. I never know what's going to happen because I'm just so dependable and stable. I'm like a library. I never change. I just, I'm like an old train. It's just me all dealing with you. Oh, goodness. If only I'd been prepared. This is a lie. There is such a thing as male PMS. It's very simple. If you want to conduct an experiment to prove it, all you've got to do is be a woman and be with a man wait until he's doing something, and then go up and talk to him. <laughs> Just put in the kitchen, he's there, he's putting a pizza in the oven, and walk in and start asking him about something, and go, what? What is it now? <laughs> Can't you see I'm trying to do something? You walk in here, on the floor, <laughs> breathing air like it's yours. Look, are you happy the pizza's on the floor? Are you happy now? Why do I even dare to imagine I could hope I could dream? <laughs> You're just like your whole family. You come in here and you carbonize and then shit on my dreams. <laughs> now, my idea is that my theory is that women are always ready for everything. They're born ready for other people. Dealing with other people. I'm not a feminist, by the way, because I'm a man, I don't think I'm allowed to be. <laughs> Lots of men out there say, oh yeah, I'm a feminist. That means they want to sleep with you. <laughs> I'm not a feminist, so I have a lot in common with most women. <laughs> who are afraid? Who are afraid to annoy men and say difficult things. Like, I don't want to go over there, I'm not doing that. Fuck off, I'm wearing a jumper all day and I'm eating burgers. Go fuck yourself. And they, they don't do that. Yeah, you're cheering me doing it, but I'm a guy. That's the problem, you need to work on that. And you need to take the hit, baby. And Because look, everybody wants to be liked, everybody wants to please other people, but you have to set up limits, you know? But men have a lot of limits. Because they're not ready, they're not able to cope with what they're supposed to do. I was, I've got a family and children, I wasn't ready for them. I wasn't ready for anything. Men spend their whole lives going, what, now? Really? <laughs> 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 well, I have to leave the womb. Well, I have to be out here. Well, I have to go to school. I have to leave. I have to go to work. I talk to somebody else. Oh, fucking hell, Jesus Christ, would somebody tell me what to do? And you're never ready. Women are always ready because they can experience what other people's feelings. They can imagine them. Men don't have that capacity a lot of the time. That's why when you see young couples sitting outside a cafe, there's a woman and a guy and a pram, the guy always looks a bit surprised. <laughs> I just thought we were going to have a few drinks. What's this situation? <laughs> I wasn't ready for children. I wasn't ready for all the things children need. Nobody warned me. Your children will need pets. You know, guinea pigs, hamsters. What the, what's the word? What's the word? Do you know? What? One person, one person. Homie. Homie. Yeah. Homie. Yes. So, what is that? A hamster guinea pig? Okay, right. For years, my children were saying, Daddy, Daddy, give me a homie, give me No. No. I don't want a rat with privileges in my house. <laughs> and in the end, I gave in because I realized it was very important for their development. Because the child's experience, the child is born, and then it's, you know, looked after by two giants, two gods, who go, go over here, eat this, go to school with millions of strangers, come home, do more work, here's a cartoon about sponges, darkness at night time, good night! <laughs> so of course, the child wants to have that godlike relationship with another being. And say, have you been a good homie? Have you been a good <laughs> Would you like some leaves? Would you like some leaves? Some kabooster? <laughs> <laughs> have you been a good Have you been a good Have you been 
betrayed me. <laughs> what have you been saying about me today? <laughs> ordinary, healthy, decent love. <laughs> it's a good thing for, the, for that child. So I gave in. We got, we got a hummock. It was this size. Look, look, this size. He ate my couch. <laughs> he ate the fucking couch. And then he ate the cables to the fridge. He had no food. And then he ate the internet. The house was dark. And then he went missing. We had to look for him. My daughter had a leaflet from the pet shop. She said, we have to look for a bad smell. I found 10,000 bad smells in the house. And no fucking comic. And then we did find him. He was back at his apartment that she'd made me buy him. He was dead at his desk. He'd been writing prison poetry. And, <laughs> and then we had to get another one, another one, another one. We have a tiny garden outside our house. It is a mass grave. It's all of these things. All they do is die. They have big eyes, they go, mm, and shit, and they die. <laughs> I am probably a bad parent. My wife and I went away for the night. We had the babysitter looking after the children and the fucking new hummock, whatever his name was, died, okay? The children were devastated. They were very upset. They were going, ah, oh, Very sorry. It's very, very sad. Cocktails. Get cocktails. Yes. We'll be home tomorrow. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Next day I got home. I picked my daughter up from school. She was still very upset. Very small. She was only six. First of all, I oh, was so sad. He was twitching and his arm. Was like... And it was sad. It was sad. And I said, It's terrible. It's really terrible. What happened then? What did you do? And she said, Then we put him in an oven glove. <laughs> you know, the glove you opened the cooker with? I said, Okay, what, what did you do then? Then we went out to play. <laughs> and I lost my shit. Because. I had to do the thing where you're laughing, you're laughing, pretending to cry, going, oh, 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 I don't, can't believe I'm talking to you about this. But this is what happened. I remember being a young man walking around Edinburgh in my city, uh, where I moved because my wife told me, and, the, um, <laughs> and seeing old middle, middle aged guys with a dog, you know, walking dog. And I'm going, you sad. <laughs> and now it's me. I'm there, the dog. Because you can't help but have a relationship with the dog. Any animal where you open the front door and it runs up and sticks its face in your crotch, you're having a relationship with it. <laughs> you care about it. And so the children wanted a dog, we got a dog, I wanted to get a, I wanted to get a, you know, a dog I recognised from when I was a child. Labradors, Spaniels, St. Bernard's, dogs. Because what happened was people started to cross-breed because they, everybody think, is told to think like a consumer. And you're told there's not enough consumer choice. That's why people cross-bred those dogs and now you get St. Spanish jackals, spoodles. Nobody knows what the fuck they are. It looks like a heron rolled in a carpet or a car wash with teeth. You don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> I went to my friend's house, he'd just got a dog, I was going to sit down in this fluffy Italian chair, it shat on my shoes. <laughs> and he ran over and said, oh you found him, that's Mr. Beans, our schnapper Daniel. And he was on his knees going, oogie woogie woogie woo, does Mr. Beans want to tickle, isn't he adorable? We called him Mr. Beans because the first thing he did when we got him in the house was, he jumped up on the table and he ate a plate of beans, isn't that adorable? I said, look, I also like beans. <laughs> But my name is not Mr. Beans. My name is Mr. Shit Shoes. <laughs> because I have shit on my shoes, okay? When you're finished giving a hand job to Mr. Beans, Mr. Shit Shoes would like a shovel. Thank you very much. But this is fundamentally another form of escape. You have the relationship with the animal because it's easier than a human relationship. Because a dog just thinks you're the coolest, craziest guy ever. With some wild plan. That's why they come up to you going, <laughs> <laughs> What's it going to be today? Is it going to be that thing where you put all the stuff in the bowl and I eat it all really quickly? Or the thing where I just go outside and shit? What's it going to be? <laughs> and you can't get away. That won't save you. Nothing will save you from other people.
This is what I'm saying. This is my point. There's no way to go. And that's the end. I'm finished now. No, I don't end with jokes. I like to end with a sense of despair. I don't understand anything. I don't pretend to. I don't understand human relationships or where I am or what's going on at any time. I am middle-aged, I am overweight and confused. The world is changing too quickly for me. I want things that I remember, things that are familiar, they no longer exist. I want everything to go backwards. I don't, I'm joking. But I don't know what's coming. And for the young people out there, you will decide. You will decide what the future of Poland is going to be. It's not up to me, I checked. <laughs> Nobody asked me to those meetings. <laughs> and you have to remain hopeful that you can change attitudes, or that people will just die. <laughs> There's always that. <laughs> and you have to remember what's good about being young. Yes, you might be poor. Yes, it's difficult. It is. It's hard to get work. All of it's hard. But you have to remember what you've got, your youth. Because, you know, people get stupid as they get old. Before they get properly stupid, and clearly old, even before then they get stupid. Because their values change. You get anxious. Because you're closer to death. If you're 25 years old and you go out and you eat and drink and talk with your friends, the most important thing is talking. You don't show off how nice the food is. You don't compete with one another. You just think, you don't even know there's food there except that one of the drinks is kind of chewy. <laughs> you wake up in your bed or somebody else's, you don't know how you got there, you don't care. You just think, hooray, the teleporter worked again. <laughs> and then a strange thing happens when you get older. People start to compete because they're close to death. So they talk strangely to you. People you thought you knew will open the door to you and say, can we give you the tour? <laughs> no. What do you want to do? Show me around your house? I have a house. It's full of shit, just like yours. I don't want to see yours. I'm an adult human being. Do you want to stand with me in a bathroom and say, this is a toilet? Is that what we're doing now? <laughs> and people have had their minds mushed by social competition, by watching cookery programs. You go to somebody's house, they bring out a starter. And what's the Polish word for that? A little dish before the main dish. That's the one. And they... <laughs> They bring out a I didn't know people did this in their own houses. I went to somebody's house, I had a panic attack. I said, what the fuck is this? If I'd known you were in this situation, I would have brought something. This is a prom pole dancing on a breadstick. Where's the food? You have to treat people simply. Here's a very wonderful Irish recipe. It's a classic from my grandmother, who's a beautiful spiritual person. She always used to say, it doesn't matter how big the other fucker is, they all have a neck. <laughs> this is my other grandmother, not the one I mentioned before. Another thing she used to say was never get involved with more than 18 people sexually because you can't remember what everybody likes and what's in the farm to do. Anyway. Another thing she used to say was the quickest way to start your own religion kill something big, make up a catchy song about it. And <laughs> This recipe is called Total Chicken. You just get a chicken, and you don't mess around with starters. You just get little things people like, like a bag of fries, or, you know, a Mars bar, and put them on the outside of the chicken. <laughs> then nobody has to get up and change plates. And this is the thing, you put a chocolate cake inside the chicken. <laughs> Everybody works from the outside in, they think it's time to go home, and you can go, no, no, surprise! <laughs> Thank you very much, everyone. Good night.
I, I, I can't, I'm going to do something old, sorry. I did other old things before, but I don't know what to talk about here in a way because I've never been here before. So I wanted to connect with people. But I don't know. I don't know here. I'm just I'm beginning to learn. But some of the things, a lot of it is, we have the universal values. Um, now I mentioned, I'm talking a lot about relationships and marriage and families and so on. And one of the things about children is that they help you become a person, not a man, a person. And I have friends who are my age, one friend in particular is my age, no children, serial relationships. It's very different. Because women know how other people feel, I think, by look. They look after other people. Men don't. Men go around and say, what's this? This is what I want. No, what's the point of it then? Why are we here? <laughs> and he's great. He's interesting to me because he asks me questions like, so what did you get up to at the weekend? What did you do? And I have to remind him, I have to say, listen, you know those children you saw me with before? <laughs> They're still alive. <laughs> I didn't do anything. I got into a sleeping bag, but they found me, okay? <laughs> but he only asks me so he can tell me what he did. Because he can tell me all about his latest adventure with his latest girlfriend. You know, it was really cool. We walked along the canal. We got one of those hop-on, hop-off hot air balloons. You walk for a bit, then you get in the balloon, then you go walking again. We went to this really cool club. It's called Umlaut. Well, it's not called Umlaut. It's just two dots over a U that isn't there. <laughs> we saw this great gig. Actually, we did a gig. I don't know if I mentioned it before, but we're in a band now. It's a very heavy sound. We're called Black Yogurt. And it's just... <laughs> 15 bass guitars. There was a lot of sex on stage. And then, uh, you know, we saw some French films that haven't been made yet. And had some Japanese pizza. You know, the stuff that's all on sticks. It's great. And I'm going now. I'm very glad you came. Thank you very much. I'll see you again.